Hello, uh, I'm Eric Windish. I am a security researcher, uh, software engineer, uh, hacker, tinkerer, um, formerly of Docker, uh, which was originally on the Prospectus um, free agent now. Um, enjoying my time off, uh, giving some talks, uh, working on some new projects. Um, I'm going to be talking about patterns for, well, what was um, patterns for secure containerized applications. Uh, and then while writing the talk, I realized, well, you know, really, we're talking about applications. We're not talking about containerized applications because if you're writing secure applications, you're using containers. I mean, that's obvious. Um, and second, why would you not write secure applications, right? So you're, you're writing applications. Um, you know, they should be secure and they should be containerized. Uh, I shouldn't have to say it. So I just struck those out. Um, I guess they're still technically in the title. Um, so I'm gonna call these three patterns. Um, and these are not necessarily all secure patterns, they're, they're patterns. Um, an isolate, a pattern of isolation, where you have services that are running on different hosts. Um, and those applications, right, those services are completely isolated from each other, um, except perhaps from the network, uh, but from a compute perspective, they are isolated. We have consolidation, where we can take that isolated um, application and throw it inside of another host and run those as VMs, right? Um, and finally, we have uh, what I'm calling fragmentation. Uh, and fragmentation, uh, while not always a, a pretty word, um, is actually not a bad thing here. Um, it just means that we're going to break up and isolate things a little more. So I'll talk first about this pattern of isolation. So we have a basic high level application with a SQL database of some sort, a message queue of some sort, um, some sort of backend web service running an API, and the front end. Um, now, each of these might contain multiple services and components. Um, we're going to simplify it and just presume that each of these is just one basic application. So, um, you know, we're going to take load balancers out of the, the picture. We're going to uh, just assume that the front end is just, um, let's say, an Nginx or Apache server or something. Um, so the whole thing is our application, and front end is our service. And in the isolation pattern, we just take that front end and we're going to say, we're going to put it in its own host. Maybe we'll put it in its own VM. And maybe we'll put it in its own container. Um, and those are separate from that container, that VM, or that bare metal machine. Uh, possibly all three of those, you know, nested like this, um, are isolating that front end from the SQL Server, the back end, and the message queue. Right? And our host, our application, looks at a high level something like this. You know, you just, your host and your VM and your container are all just the same thing. They're running all of these different applications, um, which I um, picked some fairly, some of them were kind of bad, like send mail, um, right? You know, you're running these all together um, on a host in an operating system, right? And what I'm gonna propose here is, well, why are you running SendMail um, and Apache and your monitoring agent all together on your operating system uh, where they can see each other, they can touch each other, uh, they can harm each other, right? So this pattern of isolation, um, th this first pattern, has us per having a separation of these services, but these processes are not isolated. So pattern number two is consolidation. Um, and this is uh, not actually a security pattern, but this is a pattern that I have seen a lot in our industry. And I mean, mostly it's a cost saving me measure, right? We are trying to consolidate our resources, save our resources, save power, save capital expenditures. And we want to say, well, we're going to use VMs, and we're going to eliminate this CapEx. 
we're going to run fewer machines with more services and we're just going to, you know, our hypervisors are going to provide our isolation. Right? So you have this, right? You take your isolation pattern that we had before and we literally throw it in a box and then we make, you know, the boxes inside, like they're, instead of machines, they're now VMs. And on the outside, well, now we have a real host. Um, and we're still using isolation patterns, so we're, we're, we're good, right? Um, you know, we, we've, we're isolated. Uh, these applications are secure because um, the isolation pattern that we were using before was secure, right? Running each of our servers on a different host was secure. So we're going to run them as VMs, and, and that'll be secure because, uh, well, you know, it's the same pattern, and hypervisors are certainly fine. All right. Um, so you know, containers come around, and we do the same thing, and we say, well, we're going to replace our VMs and with containers, and that's going to be great. We're going to get even better isolate, um, better consolidation. We're going to get more performance. We're going to have more resources. We're going to have more cost savings, um, and we just replace VM with the word container, and oh, that, that's probably fine, right? You know, we're consolidating. Um, However, the, the problem with this is that this was never a security model. That this was a consolidation model. This was something that was saving us money, um, and does save us money, right? This saves us even more money than the VMs. Um, and that might be okay for you, right? If this is what you want, if you're trying to save money um, at, all, you know, at all costs, then this is perfectly fine, right? You're going to save capital expense on this uh, but you are paying technical debt in your security, uh, which if security matters to you, um, is not necessarily what you want here. Um, there are use cases where this is very viable. There are people doing high frequency trading where they said, well, we couldn't use VMs. We had to use bare metal machines. But now with containers, we get high performance um, and we get better isolation than we could have before, right? So it's actually a net gain for them because the other model never worked anyway. Right? You know, and you know, people say that, well, containers aren't secure because I replace all my VMs with containers and they are just not as secure. And it drives me crazy, right? Because like, you're doing it wrong, right? Like if this is the model you're doing, um, you're doing it wrong if you're doing it and thinking it's providing you security. And arguably, you were already doing it wrong when you're using VMs. Right, because VMs do not, oh, actually that's in a couple, couple slides. Uh, so first I want to give you a little, um, a little case study. Uh, the Zen project has had 38 CVEs uh, in its past 12 months, um, as of two days ago, anyway. Um, 29 of those had a CVSS score of over four, right? These are CVEs uh, now, it all depends on how you rate CVSS numbers, and uh, they're not all created equal. Um, sometimes they are overblown, sometimes they are underblown. Uh, but I'm going to assume that out of those 29 CVEs, that at least half of them can allow a breakout from your, from your hypervisor or, or from your VM, right? Like, that's serious. Like, that's, you know, that is not really very secure, right? That's not isolation. That is not the same as running a physical bare metal, right? Um, and it's important to note because, I mean, this is Zen. And you can say, well, well, you know, VMware is better or KVM is better. There are so many fewer CVEs. Well, first of all, the absence of CVEs does not mean the absence of vulnerabilities, right? It may indicate a, re a lack of response to vulnerabilities or a lack of transparency in the resolution of vulnerabilities, right? When a, a, a virtualization vendor releases an update, you don't know whether or not they actually fix vulnerabilities in it. You don't know whether or not the KVM team perhaps may just not be signifying that vulnerabilities are important. Um, many of those vulnerabilities get reported as QEMU vulnerabilities, not KVM vulnerabilities. They get reported as kernel vulnerabilities, but meanwhile, all of these things are actually affecting you and you're just not aware of them. Um, the Zen team is actually a really great functioning team 
uh, which is why there are so many vulnerabilities, um, or CVEs, because they're actually seeking these vulnerabilities, they're finding these vulnerabilities, they're letting you know about these vulnerabilities, um, which is why there are so many CVEs. Uh, not that Zen is necessarily less secure. Um, I would argue that it probably is more secure because of this. Um, although the most recent vulnerability was particularly uh, bad. Um, there was a vulnerability released uh, yesterday, actually, which, um, well, announced yesterday, where it completely invalidates, uh, I believe, the paravirtualization model in Zen, um, which is not very good. Um, there was a patch, but it's shaken a lot of confidence, um, I think, in some of the community amongst Zen users. Um, but I would also argue that that may not be, again, limited to Zen, right? That might be just the fact that we're coming to terms with virtualization is not a panacea. It does not solve all of our problems. It does not provide the isolation that we've been guaranteed for all these years. Right? And worse, x86 right, is considered harmful. Um, and I've been actually saying this for some time, but uh, there was a, a blog post um, a couple days ago um, and a PDF attached where they go through a lot of the vulnerabilities that x86 itself has had over the last few years. Uh, some of the research that's being performed um, into these vulnerabilities and what we're learning is that x86 is an old platform that has had a lot of things added to it over the years and actually is vulnerable to quite a number of attacks. So even if your hypervisor is secure, you're, we're learning now that you can actually use, you know, just do things on the CPU directly. There are side channel attacks that you can perform. Um, there are uh, ways of potentially executing code inside of, inside of the CPU uh, at low levels that are underneath of your operating system, right? And you can do that from inside of VM um, and inside of a container, right? Um, now there are some things that we can do um, with virtualization and containers potentially to try and resolve this, but the fact is that VMs do not contain. They're not protecting us from these attacks, and we shouldn't expect them to. So consolidation may be appropriate for you, but it is not a, cons a security pattern. Right? Use it if you want to. Use it if you need to, but don't presume that throwing things in VMs um, is going to solve a security problem. And equally, don't assume that throwing everything on you know, a bunch of containers that do different things on one host is going to solve your security problems either. Right? They're both consolidation. They don't solve the security. So pattern number three um, is fragmentation, um, also known as isolation. So this is actually really the first pattern, uh, but it's a viewpoint on the pattern that we haven't really been able to explore before containers. Right? So we're going to take this isolation model on the left, which I presented earlier, and we're going to say, well, we're going to not consolidate. We're going to fragment. We are going to take the services that we're already running, and we're going to isolate them more. Right? We're going to put more lines in the sand here. We're going to not just isolate the services on different hosts. We are going to isolate the different processes that are on those hosts. Right? We're going to let the operating system do its job and try and provide some sort of security framework between those processes. Right? And I don't know if this is what you consider microservices. Uh, which is you know, literally just separating processes that are normally on host. Um, but I do. And services are isolation with more seams, right? Not more services, right? We're not trying to create here more services for you to manage necessarily, right? It may look like that because you're managing more ar artifacts in a sense, right? You know, each of these containers might look like a new host, right, from your traditional management perspective. But it's really just processes. And you've been running these processes anyway. You're just going to wrap them in a container, 
and you can imagine you know a thousand processes in a host before, and now you might manage a thousand containers on a host. Um, so we're just putting more seams though, right? We're making those those divisions between those processes harder um, or more firm, right? And it looks in a way kind of like virtualization. Um, we perhaps, which is why it gets compared to to virtualization so much, but you know we get to instead of separating these processes by um, virtual machines, right? We separate these on a single machine, and they get their own memory, their own disk, their own network, right? But they're containers, right? Like this is the model that we've been looking at with virtualization for some time, but we get to do this with arbitrary processes on our machine, and give them the benefits of well. Now we did just assess that you know virtualization is not real isolation, right? Um, and I would say that this is not real isolation either, right? But it's some isolation, right? It's quasi-isolation. Um, we can tell these processes are gonna get different sets of memory, different sets of disk, different sets of network. And if we wanna wrap all this in VMs, fine, we can do that. Um, it might protect our host from some of the attacks that are out there. Um, but importantly, virtualization cannot separate these services, right? Running web, um, the new Relic server or the Sysdig server um, on your virtualization host doesn't give you visibility into your applications necessarily. Some of the products do have like things where they can introspect VMs, great, as long as they understand the kernel on the host and the version of the kernel and everything else. But generally, those monitoring tools have to run inside of your VMs, right? Um, Apache, right, if you're gonna run a, a mail server, right, and send mails, like, again, a horrible example, um, but I put it there because it's a good example of something you don't run in, run in with you know, access to your Apache and your new Relic D and your rsyslog if it gets compromised. Um, rsyslog, right, you need to ship your log somewhere. Um, you can throw Collecti in here, you can throw any of these applications that you're going to run for operational purposes on your host and realize you can't run them on your virtualization machine, you can't run them um, outside of your host, they need to run with, in some way, right? Apache is the only one here that you actually need to have. All these other ones you need for operational purposes, yet, because you need them for operational purposes, they're, they're required. Um, and you need to be able to separate them in the way that you separate VMs. And containers, to a limited degree, allows you to do that. All right? So, we take kind of that model that we had before, which is, Here's our host with all these processes running together, and we just, you know, draw lines in the middle, and we make each of these different containers. Um, maybe not init. Init won't be at the container necessarily, um, but it may spawn Docker. It might, you know, be system D, and they can create these containers for us. Open VZ, whatever. Um, right. So we look at a container like Apache. And we have a process list. And what's interesting about this process list is that, well, you know, it's only HTTPD. It's not in it. It's not all of these other things that might be able to compromise our HTTPD if it were, um, if were compromised. Um, and we also have here capabilities. And this is an important part of containers, which is that we can say this container cannot does not have CAP system in it, doesn't have sys module, it doesn't have DAC override. So if we run this, for instance, as a non root user, uh, this container may not be able to elevate the root. Um, and if it did elevate the root, it wouldn't be able to override other users' files, only its own files. Right? So root can change its own files, like any user, but it can't change other users' files. Uh, it can't load kernel modules, uh, but we're going to say, well, we're going to add net bind service and net raw, which says that this container can ping um, and can bind to port 80, right? So here's a container that potentially could be kind of everything but root, but still bind to port 80, which only root can normally do, right? And this is something that, by the way, virtual machines cannot do, right? So here's an example of your Apache server, right, or your front end machine running on a VM or on just a bare metal machine. And 
you have your process list, which includes our syslog, send mail, new relic, and your init server. Uh, but also, um, it has all the capabilities. All of these processes can do all of the things. So if any of these processes were, for instance, running as root, or if, let's say, they had access to a binary that was set UID, such as um, sbin su, right? You have the su access, you have sudo access. Um, they have a capability of elevating to root, right? Even if they're not run as root, they can become root. Uh, because they have the capability to become root, right? Containers let us take away abilities, such as becoming root. In this traditional model, you are just, you know, you always have the capability to become root. Um, unless, of course, you create a container mechanism. Um, so any of these processes, right, could elevate the root, could do anything to Apache that it wanted to. Right? Well, you know, well, damn, this seems like a lot of work. Right now, I have to manage all of these containers, right? I mean, I I'm telling you, you're going to have all these containers. Now, granted, you have all the same processes anyway, but now it's a new artifact. It's a new container system, right? You need a lot of work. You need to write, build containers for these. You need to build Docker files. You need to um, have a whole system for managing this and deploying this. Except you've, if, if you're using Chef or Puff or Ansible or Salt, um, CF Engine, I don't care what you're using. If you're using any of these, you're already doing it, right? Each of these things, you already have, if you're using Chef, you're already making a Chef cookbook for RSYSLog, but a cookbook for SendMail, and a cookbook for Apache, and a cookbook for New Relic D. You're making a cookbook for Sysdig. You're making a cookbook for whatever it is that you're running. You may not be running in a container right now, but you're running it out of a cookbook or a recipe or a manifest or whatever your system calls it, um, a crumb. I, I, I don't know all the, the terms of all the different DevOps tools, but you're already building automation for these tools. So you just say, well, instead of building a cookbook for this necessarily, I'm going to build a Docker container for this, or I'm going to build um, you know, an OpenBZ container or an LXC container. Um, and that's really the crux there, right? It's not that hard. If you can build chef cookbooks, you can build containers. Um, and if you want to, you can build any of these salts. You, know, you can build containers using those tools. But you can take your existing tools, you can say, well, I need an R syslog server, I already have a chef cookbook for it. Okay, fine, use your chef cookbook, build a container, and use that to deploy your containers and not just processes on your host. Because this is going to isolate those processes <coughs> from each other. Um, and it's going to protect them from each other, right? And it does it deep down. It does it in a way that, oh, so it does it in a way where um, VMs you couldn't, right? VMs were not granular. Hosts are not granular. You couldn't control um, what those processes in it were doing. This lets you dig, dig, dig the claws of isolation deeper. So I gave plenty of room for questions today. <laughs> so the capabilities you were talking about uh, were basically the Linux kernel capabilities. Yes. In the list, I mean, obviously they could be something else, but that's where you got this from. Yeah, so those capabilities uh, that I referred to are capabilities in the Linux kernel. Now, containers apply to other platforms, and they're going to call these other things. Um, these happen to be POSIX capabilities, generally. So POSIX compatible systems may have them, um, but not all containerization systems actually necessarily care about capabilities. So like FreeBSD <coughs> um, may care a little bit less, like they have a whole the jail system um, is not just capabilities, um, same as Solaris. Um, Linux is a little bit more granular and kind of, we're gonna provide the crumbs and you, and you kind of piece together the cake yourself. Um, some of the other operating systems kind of provide containers as a more whole unit. Um, by the way, for the first person to ask a question, uh, which was you, you get a title. Um, this lets you find things wherever they are. I don't know, it's like using Bluetooth or something. So, um, good. Let's say if you dropped it, you can still find it because it has a, <laughs> a MAC address or something you can look up online. Uh, <laughs> um, earlier you did a certain thing 
Apache running on a VM would be running as root. I've, I've always run Apache as not the root user. So I'm thinking I'm not, I'm not understanding you. Um, no, so I'm not saying it runs necessarily as root. Although Apache, for example, is usually spawned as root and then drops down to another user. That way you can bind to port 80. Okay. Um, also, some people use Apache so that it runs as root and then each of its sub-processes run as a different user, right? So if you have you know, a single Apache server, you can then have you know, five different users and it manages processes for these users. Um, and I'm not saying that you have to run Apache as root, right? I mean, you, you shouldn't run Apache as root. You should run it as a non-root user and put a reverse proxy in front of it, perhaps. Um, but even if you run it as non-root, it still has access by default to set UID binary. So if there's a vulnerable set UID binary that's living in your file system, you can become root. If you're running in a container, you can say, well, set UID binaries just don't work. We refuse to let set UID binaries work. <coughs> right? And that just removes a class of vulnerabilities. There are still other vulnerabilities, right? But we'll remove a class of vulnerabilities. And when we're working in security, um, there, there, there's no you know, hammer that solves all problems, right? And we've treated VMs like a hammer for a long time. Um, we, we need to be able to say, take away some of these vectors. Take away set UID. It's not even a vector anymore. It's gone. Any other questions? I, I know we're all hungry for lunch. It's, um, <laughs> all right. Three more seconds? Nope. All right, thank you.